I will now introduce to you Rich Westfall, who will uh, give us our invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Rich is the Director of Graduate Development for the Center for Print and Broadcast. Thank you, Rich. Now I'm going to present to you Josh Mercer for an update on the Student Publication School, which he tells me is one to two minutes long. Josh Mercer is a campus journalism uh, coordinator for our Student Publications Department, uh, which focuses on training students to start conservative newspapers on college campuses as an alternative to the typical uh, radical left newspapers that are the official publications on, on almost all of our uh, college and university campuses. Josh started his own newspaper with the help of a balance in media grant given to him by the Leadership Institute graduate while he was a student at Hillsdale College. Well, balancing the media at Hillsdale College is certainly <laughs> desirable, but I, uh, um, I, uh, it's an exercise, perhaps, in trying to be more Catholic than the Pope. Um, uh, Hillsdale, as many of you know, is a very conservative college, um, and so uh, he sent his national newspaper to students suffering under political correctness at other and left-wing universities. Uh, a gra as a graduate of the Leadership Institute, um, uh, he is proud, and we are proud to have Mr. Mercer on our staff, helping us to train the next generation of conservative leaders. Josh? Good morning. Okay, do conservative papers make a difference? Well, I'll give an example here. I was at the uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, and I, I picked up this newspaper. And it's pretty interesting because Gloria Stein, who I just got done speaking at the university, and she was called an icon of the feminist movement. And later that day, a new, another speaker was coming to campus. He was Ward Connolly, who ended affirmative action in the state of California. He was a controversial regent. So that's a, this is a school that does not yet have a conservative newspaper, and we're working hard to get a conservative paper there. But let's give an example of a, of a school that has competition. Well, here's Berkeley. Berkeley's main paper. Dan Flynn came to speak on campus about how Mumia is actually a criminal. I'm sure you've heard of the Mumia movement, who's trying to uh, make sure that Mumia is not considered a criminal, but he is actually a cop killer. But anyway, the story that they focused on in the mainstream paper was that, well, a bunch of protesters didn't like his speech. But luckily, conservatives have a voice at Berkeley, the California Patriot, which told the real story that the protesters not only interrupted his speech, but they burned his books, that these guys are Nazi thugs. So this is why it's important to have conservative media on our campuses. Those guys at Berkeley are true heroes. And they actually got media attention. The Washington Times ran a story on their national page about it. So it's, they're making a big impact. Uh, the, you know, the Berkeley incident is just one of many different campuses. There's other campuses that are making impact. There's a newspaper at Georgetown that's making a lot of impact there. I just want to give you this as an example. The cons what we do at the Student Publications Department is we have, as Morton was talking about, a balance of media grant where we give $500 to help a publication get started, get off the ground. And we were able to award that to 18 different newspapers last year. So there's 18 newspapers now that are on campuses that weren't there before. So we're changing these schools from like Santa Barbara into Berkeley. We're going to get them get the conservative message out there. Not that we want more Berkeley's, but the idea is we want more competition at the schools. One of the new aspects we're doing is we have a thing called paper in the box. And a paper in a box is a nice little thing we send out to students that we hear about that are interested in starting a publication. It's the first step that we take to get them educated and trained. And it's a step, it involves a step-by-step -step procedure on how to get a newspaper started. It's got an AP style book in there. It's got different suggestions for news ideas. And then we bring them in to the student publication school here in Arlington. We get, them in, we get them trained, and we send them out there to the campuses, and we get them started. So we're happy to say that there are now uh, 59 campuses, or, sorry, 53 campuses where we have, main, uh, we have mainstream conservative newspapers that are getting the message out to our campuses. So we're looking onward next year to, to, to get several more campuses started. So we're always invigorated. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Josh. Uh, you might be interested to know that in 99, our uh, staff set a record for uh, creating new campus papers. They kept creating 12, and then in 2000, they set a second record, which is 18 new ones, which is pretty good. To introduce our scintillating major speaker for the, for the day, uh, I want to present to you Mike Krompaski, uh, the uh, graduate development director for us. Mike directs our efforts to reach out and develop relationships with graduates of, of our 18 programs. Uh, previously, Mike worked as the regional coordinator in the campus leadership program where he developed independent concerning student organizations um, in, uh, in our, uh, our area we call Seven. Um, he's a native Pennsylvanian. Mike admits to being a convert to conservatism. As the son of a fairly radical leftist set of parents, his father is a professional environmentalist, environmentalist and his mother uh, was arrested with Dorothy Day in the 60s. Uh, Mike came to trust, uh, came, came to the truth just before leaving home to attend the University of Richmond. Uh, to study political science. Needless to say, fireworks are never in short supply at his home on Thanksgiving dinner. And Mike also serves on the alumni board at the Fund for American Studies. Mike Krompaski. <coughs> Good morning. The best news I got this morning was finding out that our speaker's bio was actually printed in the program which means I really don't have to worry about the canned uh, biography that people repeat over and over and over again. I generally don't like them. However, this one does have some uses when they fax it over to me, and I'll, I'll tell you that in a second. P.J. O'Rourke speaks all over the world. He's a best-selling author. He, he uh, at one point, was the editor-in-chief of National Lampoon. He currently is the international affairs editor for Rolling Stone. But when I came to learn about P.J. O'Rourke, it was through his books. Uh, over the course of his writing career, he has uh, taught us in his Bachelor Home Companion that flambeing was really what you told your guest while at the same time telling your insurance agent that it was simply a short in the house wiring. <laughs> and then in his most recent book, Eat the Rich, he answered the question why some places prosper and thrive while other places just suck. <laughs> now, the extraordinary thing about his writing is, as, as Morton mentioned, my, my parents are, uh, let's say, left of center. But there's only a few books that I've ever been able to give them with any sort of common sense that they've enjoyed. And, and, and one of them was, in fact, Eat the Rich. Uh, he's got this wonderful talent to combine real, true, common sense thinking with uh, just a biting sense of humor. Now, he's a Miami of Ohio graduate, uh, then went on to study at Johns Hopkins. And the most, one of the funniest things that's happened to me in recent weeks is the other day when I knew that I was going to be introducing him this morning, uh, in fact, just this weekend, I went off with some friends to, uh, let's call it a bar in DC, as young people occasionally do. And I'd never been there. I didn't know what I was really going to. I knew that it was called the State of the Union. Well, when I got there, I found out the emphasis was on the word state. And the Union was really referring to the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. It actually has a hammer and sickle as the logo. So we go into the, we go into the establishment, uh, wherein you find a big bust of Lenin on top of the bar, and then a little bust of Lenin right next to it. You find a Soviet flag hanging down from uh, the middle of the bar, a six by six painting of Rasputin behind the band, and in order to get to the restroom, you actually have to pull aside the Soviet flag shower curtain looking thing to even get there. Now, the only reason I bring this up is because when I did make a visit to the restroom and it was covered in graffiti and, and you know, workers of the world unite, actually the only readable thing uh, on the entire wall was this quote, which also happens to be the last line of P.J. Rourke's biography. <laughs> and as he puts it, and as it reads on the wall there at the restroom at the State of the Union, giving money and power to politicians is like giving whiskey and car keys to teenagers. <laughs> P.J. O'Rourke. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, thank you very much for, for having me here, and thanks. I, I, I also want to extend thanks for the opportunity to eat meat at breakfast, something I'm not allowed to do at home. <laughs> so, um, quite a bit of meat at breakfast, as a matter of fact. Well, um, George Bush is his president. Um, it was a little messy getting them uh, uh, there, um, but I don't mind that. Uh, I don't mind that it was messy getting George uh, uh, to be president because I'm a good Republican and I'm a bad golfer, and I don't mind scoring ugly. You know, I mean, <laughs> ricochet off the ball washer, hit a caddy, roll into the cup, fine, <laughs> no problem. You know? But actually, that that is not my my topic this morning. My topic is one that I think um, that will apply to anyone who is in. Uh, in business or, or politics, uh, my topic being business or politics, which is worse. Um, <laughs> well, at the moment, I prefer politics uh, uh, because I, 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 I'm, I'm just, I love the way the Clintons left the White House. You know, I mean, pardoning Himmler and stealing all the White House fish knives. Um, anything George W. does for the next six months is going to look wise and statesmanlike by comparison. So I'm happy. But I'm also, as a Republican, I'm even happier that Hillary Clinton got elected uh, uh, to the Senate from New York. As we Republicans were practically out of people to hate in the Senate. You know? I mean, uh, Teddy Kennedy is too old, too out of shape, uh, too drunk, frankly, to pick on. Um, having Hillary in the Senate is such good news. This has to be worth a couple hundred million a year in GOP fundraising. I mean, every time she smirks that little smirk, you know, it's big casino for Republican campaign <laughs> caucus. Also feel that electing Hillary is good for the nation because the, the main purpose of the U.S. Senate is to keep 100 middle-aged blowhards out of the private sector where they can do <laughs> real damage. So, um, Although it is going to be somewhat interesting having the Senate split right down the uh, middle between Democrats and Republicans, it's going to lead to some interesting compromises. Uh, Good news for the Democrats, abortion will remain legal. The bad news, the baby will have a gun. Um, <laughs> now, um, we Republicans are all hoping that nobody uh, uses garlic and silver crucifixes to chase Strom Thurmond out into the sunlight <laughs> or shrivel to a crisp. <laughs> but, uh, of course, the election itself. The election itself was also split right down the middle. The Republicans won the electoral vote thanks to the prevalence of Vogtzheimer's disease in Palm Beach County. <laughs> Richard Vigilante, uh, you know, has taken over at the, uh, uh, at the American Spectator said, uh, and I'm going to steal the joke right from him, is that, that when Democrats found out that 14,000 people in Palm Beach County were too dumb to operate the punch card ballot, how was it that those Democrats instinctively knew that the 14,000 votes were for Al Gore? <laughs> Good question, one that hasn't been answered yet. <laughs> so the Republicans won the electoral vote, uh, and, and the Democrats won, won the popular vote, uh, if you count all the voters in Chicago who voted in alphabetical order, whether they were alive or not. Uh, and the thing basically came out even, and I think I can tell you why this presidential election came out even. It was because everybody was mad at both the candidates. I mean, of course, Democrats were mad at Bush and Republicans were mad at Gore, but Democrats were mad at Gore, too. You know? I mean, imagine being the sitting vice president in a very popular administration during the biggest economic boom in American history, and you can't manage a decisive win over a dyslexic, tongue-tied governor of Baja, uh, Oklahoma. You know, I mean... <laughs> And Republicans were mad at Bush, you know? I mean, how stupid do you have to be to lose Michigan to a guy who hates cars? <laughs> you just go to Michigan, you hold up earth in the balance, and you say, guy hates cars, wrote it in a book. <laughs> That's all you have to do. I mean, these candidates were idiots. Uh, um, well, now they weren't. Well, they weren't really idiots. I mean, they, they'd gone to Harvard and Yale. Not that the other idiots hadn't gone to Harvard and Yale. But I mean, no. What I, I'm saying there is that they're that Gore and Bush are educated idiots. Um, they're part of a privileged class of elite Americans who have hockey hockey score IQs and the and the best educations that money can buy. Now, I want to tell you that if Bush and Gore had grown up on my block in Toledo, Ohio they would not have gone to Harvard and Yale. They would have gone to Kent State. 
You know, and, and I think it's pretty easy to picture Bush and Gore at Kent State circa about 1970. Uh, you know, Gore picking up on the hippie thing a little late, getting his bell bottoms from the Sears catalog, and George W. in a real National Guard unit shooting out. Um, <laughs> anyway. anyway, we got George Bush. This is good because we hope to get a big tax cut from 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 from, from George. Top tax bracket will be lowered from 39.6 percent to 33 percent, and that, that's that's great. This is a case of politics being good for business, sort of. But, I mean, you know, it's only going to take $150,000 a year to get into that 33% category. Now, $150,000 a year, that, that's nice money, uh, but it's not uh, wild Willie Gates income territory. You know, I mean, there you are, making $150,000 a year, doing good, working hard, making America strong and prosperous, and the government's getting a third of your pay. Now, is the government doing a third of your work? You know? Is the government even doing a third of your laundry? You know, I mean, when you go to a bar, is the government, uh, uh, you know, their uh, attending bar making sure that uh, one out of three uh, martinis is on the house? No, you know, I mean, if your spouse is feeling romantic and you're tired, does the government take care of foreplay? No. <laughs> um, and did we think that George W. Bush was going to cut government spending? Uh, no, I mean, he's going right ahead with the Medicare prescription giveaway program. Now, we give billions of dollars to old people in this country, and a lot of those old people are not standing on street corners with cardboard signs reading, will work for pills. You know, I mean, <laughs> average household net worth for Americans over 65 is more than a quarter of a million dollars. Average net worth. Granny could kick in something for her doctor bills. She's not saving for a jet ski, you know. I mean, and I'm, I'm a little bit, I'm sorry, I've a little bit kind of just had it with the greatest generation stuff, you know. I mean, no offense to anybody here who is a, 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 a veteran of World War II. There are exceptions in every generation, even the obnoxious, hideous generation in the 60s that I came from. But uh, still, today's retirees had one stock market crash in 1929, and it took them a dozen years to go out and get a job. You know, then they waited around till Germany and Japan had conquered half the world before it occurred to them to get involved in World War II. Uh, after that, they got surprised by a million red Chinese in Korea. Now, where do you put a million red Chinese? <laughs> that will be a surprise. You know? And after that, they spent the entire 50s watching Lawrence Welk and designing tail fins. Uh, they, they, they came up with the idea for Vietnam, thanks. Um, and, uh, and they elected Richard Nixon. Um, so when it comes to more Social Security and Medicare benefits, the hell with it. <laughs> <laughs> or actually, actually, the hell with me. Because I'm the one who is going to be old and broke when the Social Security chain letter finally runs out. Put your name at the bottom of the list, mail a check for $1,250 to everyone over 65, break this chain, and you will never be elected to national office. <laughs> There's no money in the Social Security Trust Fund. Uh, there never was any money in the Social Security Trust Money is a government IOU. Government can't create a trust fund by saving its IOUs. I mean, any more than I was able to create a trust fund for myself by writing, I get a chunk of money when I turn 21 on a piece of paper, you know? I mean, Social Security is just such a piece of paper, except it says, I get a chunk of money when I turn 65. The government promises. Uh, consult American Indians for fuller discussion of government <laughs> promises. <laughs> this is a worry, uh, but actually I'll tell you, worry, worrying is really what I've come here to talk to you about, because worrying is what all of you really do for a living. I mean, this is, it's the post-industrial economy. You're not in business, you're not in politics. I mean, you're, you're, you're in worry is what you're in. I mean, worry is what almost every management level person in America does all day, except for the guy with the nose ring down in corporate communications nibbling hashish brownies and putting the company website together. Um, <laughs> he's not worried. <laughs> but the rest of us, we're, we're, we're worried. Now, personally, I think this worrying is the secret of America's success in the modern world. Uh, the French aren't worried. Uh, they're too busy taking three-hour lunches and screwing up the euro. Um, the, uh, the Russians aren't worried. They're drunk. Uh, and, the, and the Japanese were so busy actually making things that they didn't take the time to worry. You know, and look what it got them, an economic Iwo Jima. So we worry. But I bring good news about this. We only have two things to worry about that can't be treated with Viagra. Um, business and politics. 
And President Clinton actually tried treating politics with Viagra, and it, it worked. Um, <laughs> well, I feel that we don't have to worry about domestic politics anymore. The cheaters beat the thieves in Florida, and that's taken care of. And uh, even if George W. Bush is not exactly the man of our dreams, uh, Bill Clinton did prove one thing, that as long as business is good, it doesn't matter who's president. Uh, we could have a rutting dog in the Oval Office, um, and we did. Um, <laughs> And then there's international politics, however, that, and that, that, it, that is a bit of a worry, what with the, the situation in the Middle East. Um, you know, you, sometimes you have to wonder about God's sense of humor. I mean, God, God could have put all that oil in Orlando. You know, I mean, that's, 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 that's powers. Of course, an OPEC run by Disney would in of itself be pretty frightening. <laughs> gas sells for five dollars a gallon or we come and take your kids little mermaid videos in there. So, actually I have been worried for a while now about our foreign policy about international politics uh, particularly worried ever since we got involved in that that air war in Kosovo um, we sure taught the the world a lesson in Kosovo you know wherever there's oppression or suffering or injustice we, the United States, will show up six months late and bomb the country next to where it's happening. <laughs> um, I guess the uh, look out Egypt is the uh, 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 message there. I, I went to Kosovo, actually, I guess about uh, uh, 14, 15 months ago, I went to, to Kosovo to cover the NATO peacemaking efforts. Really heartening, uh, all those Serbs and Albanians. Group hug. Um, <laughs> There is a saying they have in uh, former Yugoslavia. They say, only the odd-numbered world wars begin in the Balkans. <laughs> um, you know, really, when it comes to politics, to worrying about politics, I miss Monica Lewinsky. You know, I, I, I'm with the rest of the, the I'm with, with the Democrats on this. You know, I mean, I, uh, I you know, we're not going to get this kind of thing in a Republican administration. I mean, de Democratic political wives are often members of the Bar Association. Republican wives are members of the NRA. You know, so we're just not going to get the Monica situation in the Republican administration. But I've got to say, Monica simply didn't worry me at all. Uh, uh, and I, the reason she didn't worry me was that covering politics was just was so much more fun during a, 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 an impeachment, and, and also the politicians were a lot better behaved during the impeachment. I mean, because during an impeachment, politicians are really busy hating each other. You know, they don't have time to pester the voters or bomb places they can't spell or break up Microsoft. You know, I mean, I just felt there was no downside to that impeachment. Um, Clinton won, you know, so we escaped being bored to death by an Al Gore presidency. Uh, Al could go back to his previous job as a sequoia in Redwood National Forest. Uh, <laughs> Republicans got hurt, true, for, for prosecuting Clinton, but, you know, I didn't really mind that much um, because all the Republicans had done since they took over Congress, as far as I was concerned, was play dead during federal budget negotiations and advocate school prayer. And not real prayer, not even real prayer, just a moment of silence. Democrats are very opposed to a moment of silence in public schools. Uh, silence can lead to thinking, and if people get to thinking, uh, they might become Republicans. Uh, but <laughs> anyway, basically everybody came up a winner in the Clinton impeachment. Paula Jones got a nose job. Monica Lewinsky got a Barbara Walters interview. Uh, Saddam Hussein got the airstrikes that he needed to keep his domestic approval ratings up. Uh, <laughs> and Bill uh, Clinton's uh, approval ratings went so high he started dating again. Um, Plus, we must think of the blessing to millions of future high school students trapped in the dreary confines of American history class. Finally, a chapter of the boogies. Okay? So, uh, now, not everyone was as enthusiastic about the impeachment as I was. Some people said the impeachment distracted President Clinton from governing. But I think distracting President Clinton from governing is like distracting a, a bear from eating your kid. You know? <laughs> No, I, I enjoyed the impeachment. I enjoyed the impeachments also because for the same reason that I'm enjoying the 50-50 split in the Senate, uh, because it causes legislative gridlock. I like legislative gridlock. The thing I hate is when we get bipartisan consensus, you know, because bipartisan consensus is like when my doctor and my lawyer agree with my wife that I need help. <laughs> So I think, I don't know, in the largest sense, I think we can just quit worrying about politics, really, at least for the time being, and start worrying about business. I mean, you know, especially if any of you are heavily invested in the e-commerce dot-com uh, uh, aspect of business. If you've got your 
whole portfolio in the dot com IPOs. I, I have a great NASDAQ investors counseling kit, uh, which I'll, I'll pass out after the speech. It consists of 200 sleeping pills and a plastic bag to tie over your head. <laughs> You know, and the thing about, about this, this is that I, I don't think that just because Republicans call themselves the party of business that voting Republicans is necessarily going to fix problems with, uh, 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 with our economy. Because, you know, to tell the truth, we have two political parties, the stupid party and the silly party, you know, and, and, and politicians in both those parties tend to be convinced that the most important thing in business is politicians. Now, I've covered Washington for more than a dozen years. I have met plenty of politicians. I know them. I like them. Politicians are wonderful people as long as they stay away from things they don't understand, such as working for a living. <laughs> Once politicians start to meddle with our jobs and businesses, they become ratchet-jawed purveyors of monkey doodle and baked wind. They are piddlers upon merit, beggars at the doors of accomplishment, thieves of livelihood, envy-coddling tax lice applauding themselves for giving away other people's money. They are pig herders tending the sow who eats her young, the welfare state. <coughs> They are muck-dwelling bottom feeders growing fat on the grievances and disappointments of the electorate. They are the ditch carp in the great river of democracy. <laughs> and this is what one of their friends says. <laughs> um, too many of our politicians do not understand the most basic law of economics, which is this. When buying and selling are controlled by legislation, the first things that get bought and sold are legislators. Simple as that. Too many of our politicians think that everyone with a problem in our society is a victim of economic injustice. Politicians think business causes the world's problems. Now, you know how Bill Gates likes to sneak off the Microsoft campus at night and sell crack and get teenage girls pregnant, you know? <laughs> and too many of our politicians have no understanding of the two fundamental rules of a free society. Mind your own business, keep your hands to yourself. Hillary, mind your own business. Bill, keep your hands to yourself. <laughs> Now, there are some bad people in business, my broker, uh, but, but, but I, I would argue that there are worse people in politics. I mean, consider our ex-president. I mean, he, he's looking for work. Would you, would you hire him? Would you hire Bill Clinton to mow your lawn? No, I mean, I mean, first he'd have to consult polling data, right, to see what, what kind of lawn mowing was most popular, you know, power mowers or push, doing the back first or the front, you know. Then he'd say he was mowing your lawn. I mean, he'd say he was mowing everyone's lawn. You know, rich and poor, foreign and domestic. But the minute you turned your back on him, he'd be in the kitchen raiding the refrigerator and hitting on your babysitter. You know, I mean, the free market can be unfair. We all know that. But the only alternative to the unfairness of the free market is politics. And personally, I would rather start a Mike Tyson quick bite fast food chain, you know, than, than trust politics to solve my problems. You know? I mean, how many times have politicians simplified the tax code? How many times have we heard that? And what happens every April 15th? You know, it's like a house call from Dr. Kevorkian, you know, except, except it lasts longer, you know? Then there's campaign finance reform that John McCain is completely wrong about. I know John, I like John, I respect John enormously, but he's wrong about campaign finance reform because either the money for elections comes from special interests, which we know is bad, you know, or, but if it doesn't, oh, that money has to come, if it doesn't come from special interests, it has to come from the government itself. And that would mean that people who want to run the government would have to get their campaign money from the people who run the government already. Now, you see something a little East German about that? <laughs> now, the Republicans, the, the stupid party, uh, they promised they were going to make, make the government smaller. And they succeeded with their part of the government. Republican majority in Congress is definitely... <laughs> 
<laughs> Meanwhile, the Democrats, the silly party, you know, are renting the Los Alamos Nuclear Weapons Laboratory, uh, uh, renting it out for Chinese weddings and bar mitzvahs, uh, you know, while, while Al Gore was raising money from the Indonesian equivalent of the Gambino family. Um, I tell you, every election, it is a, it's a reluctant march to the polls for me. I hate to vote. Uh, of course, we have to do it. We have to vote. Uh, otherwise, the person our spouse is for will win. Um, <laughs> no. Even if you start out with the lowest possible expectations, uh, 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 political systems will disappoint you, you know, and the American political system is no exception. I mean, we've got the Democrats. They're the party of government activism. They're the party that says government can make you richer, taller, smarter, better looking, take a dozen strokes off your golf game. And then there are the Republicans. They're the party that says government doesn't work, and then they get elected and prove it. Um, <laughs> Democrats are a coalition party, uh, broad-based broad-based coalition, UAW and the tree huggers, rednecks and Gloria Steinem, uh, 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 Louis Farrakhan and Benai Brith, uh, uh, Democrats of the Cat Canary Love Association, you know, dogs, uh, dogs and mailmen united. Uh, <laughs> Jesse Jackson once said that the Democratic Party needs both its left wing and its right wing to fly, but I mean, with Hillary Clinton out on the tip of one primary feather and Dick Morris out on the other, I mean, this, this, this bird must be the size of Epcot Center, you know, <laughs> don't stand out, out in the yard, you know, and it, flies overhead. Um, what Democratic politicians promise is more, a whole lot more of, of something to be named at a later date. What Republicans politicians promise is a little less uh, of whatever the Democrats are promising, uh, plus death penalties. Um, <laughs> Democrats say we don't know what's wrong with America, but we can fix it. The Republicans say there's nothing wrong with America, and we can fix that. Uh, and, and all politicians, no matter what party they belong to, all politicians want the government to solve every one of America's problems, from curing cancer to scheduling carpools for soccer moms. You know? They want government to do this. Now, government can't run a post office. I mean, government has trouble figuring out where mail goes, and mail has got our address, right? <laughs> <laughs> and what we get in this country is a choice between Democrats who can't learn from the past and Republicans who can't stop living in it, uh, between Democrats who want to tax us to death and Republicans who would prefer that we get shot with an assault rifle by a lunatic in the workplace. Uh, so politics versus business. I'll take business. You know, A dishonest businessman will steal from you directly instead of getting the IRS to do it for him. You know? And when businessmen ruin the environment, destroy the supply of affordable housing, and wreck the industrial infrastructure, at least they make a buck off these things. Right? <laughs> Politicians just do it for fun. You know? so, but, I tell you, but to be fair, to be fair, there is a reason that people get confused about the kind of role that politics should play in business. And this is because the political system and the economic system send contradictory messages. And of course, we're all part of both systems. Economics sends us the message, I better, I better not be poor. I better get rich. I better make more money than other people. While politics sends us the message, some people make more money than other people. Some people are rich and other people are poor. Isn't that terrible? I mean, we better close that economic gap. It is so unfair. Well, I'm here to speak in favor of unfairness. You know, I, I like the economic gap. I like, I like gaps of every kind. Because, I mean, think about this. Do we want to close the beauty gap and make sure that all women look like Margaret Thatcher? <laughs> Do we want to close the talent gap? You know, and get an NFL full of football players who have the average talent, average age, and average size of me. No, no. No, a world without inequality, everybody the same height, the same color, the same social class, everybody with the same vacation. Six billion people headed for Disney World in the first two weeks of August, you know? The wait for Space Mountain is now 1,000 years. <laughs> I say the hell with the wealth gap. I mean, what we need in this country is more wealth, even if it means bigger gaps. because. Wealth is not a pizza where if I have too many slices, you have to eat the Domino's box. I mean, wealth, wealth is not a zero-sum game. You know? In a free country with property rights and rule of law, there are no losers when somebody gets rich. Wealth is good. You know, I mean, even Hillary Clinton knows this about her own wealth. You know, I mean, she's got an eight million dollar book contract. You know, let me tell you, somebody who's been writing for a living for thirty years, eight million is a little higher than average. <laughs> You got to move that decimal point about three times <laughs> before you get. 
But I don't, I don't, I don't mind. I don't mind. Good for Hillary. Good for Hillary because you know when somebody gets rich, this is great. They, they improve their life. They improve their family's life. They invest in worthwhile things. They help their friends and neighbors. Hillary Clinton knows that. Hillary Clinton knows that her wealth is good, but she just thinks your wealth is terrible. Your wealth causes economic gaps and social injustice. But I'll tell you something that, that closing that economic gap is worse than just dumb. Economic leveling is immoral. Economic fairness is a sin. The Old Testament is very clear about this. Now, now the Bible might seem a strange place to, to do economic research, especially by a fellow like myself who goes to church about once a year because my wife says that if I don't go to church, the Easter Bunny won't come. But, uh, <laughs> I, uh, but I've been thinking from an economic point of view uh, 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 about, about the Tenth Commandment. Now, you see, the, the first nine commandments concern theological principles and social law. Thou shalt not make graven images, uh, steal, kill, etc. Fair enough. But then there's the, the Tenth Commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. So again, now here are God's basic rules about how we should live. Just ten rules. A very brief list of sacred obligations and solemn moral precepts. And number ten is don't envy your buddy's cow. What is that doing there? I mean, why would God, with just ten things to tell Moses, choose as one of those things jealousy about livestock next door? And yet think about this. Think how important this commandment is to the well-being of a community. Because it says if you want a donkey, if you want a pot roast, if you want a cleaning lady, don't whine about what the people across the street have. Go get your own, you know? I mean, the Tenth Commandment sends a message to people who believe that wealth is best obtained by redistribution, by entitlement programs, by tax and spend politics, and the message is clear and concise, go to hell. Do <laughs> <laughs> um, um, you some questions? Do we, we have time? Does anybody want to do any... I mean, I mean, that's all I know. Uh, but <laughs> if anybody has any questions, uh, I'll make up some other stuff. Uh, <laughs> anyone out there knows? Can I get more is breakfast? There <laughs> is, is there any hope for all of this except to laugh at it? Is there any hope for all of this except to laugh at it? Basically, no. There's not any hope for this. You know, the, the hope, we, yes, of course there is hope on the political front. You know where we see that hope? Low voter turnout. You know, because it is. Because you know what low voter turnout means? It means people have a life, you know? I mean, they're measuring, let's say that they're measuring their time only in terms of minimum wage. You know, they're thinking, politics doesn't involve me. You know, I don't depend enough on politics to spend two hours fiddling around, you know, at, at the local grade school standing in line to vote. Uh, that's like uh, $10.30. It's not worth $10.30 for me to make a political decision. Why is that? Because I have a real life. I don't depend on politics for my life. I don't go to politicians to fix my problems. I don't want to go to politicians to fix my problems. And, and I mean, the more Americans realize, as Americans traditionally have, that government should play a very limited and restricted role in its life, uh, uh, you know, guard the coasts and privatize the mail delivery system. You know, I mean, as soon as when we realize that, that is our hope. Our hope, there is no hope for the political system, no, but there's considerable hope in avoiding it. Sir? Do you have any thoughts on the uh, tax package from the. Uh, the tax package with, with, with Bush, I, I find disappointing. Not not because I don't like tax cuts, not think, uh, but because I want to see a concentration on spending. You know, government spending is the key. Spending is where, where, where government power comes from. It's where government abuse of power comes from. It's where the harm is done to the economy. It's where the harm is done to the society. And Milton Friedman pointed out years ago that governments will finance their spending. It doesn't matter how, really. I mean, it may matter to individuals, but overall it doesn't matter how governments finance the spending. The, the, what matters is the spending. Governments can finance the spending with taxes, they can finance it with, with borrowing, and they can finance it by just printing a bunch more money with inflation. And they, and, or, as, uh, as, as was the model in the Carter years, they can do all three. You know? <laughs> uh, but but the, the key is spending, and I, see, I don't see enough concentration on spending. In fact, the thing that really worries me about Bush administration, I mean, it's not that he's advocating a lot more spending, uh, although you notice that budget didn't shrink, it didn't grow as fast as it did under Clinton, but it didn't actually shrink in absolute terms. But the, the problem is, I see 
George W. planting these little spending bombs, you know, a little bit of something for education here, a little bit with faith-based initiatives there, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And you know what it is with government programs. They never get smaller. They never go away. You know, they are a tumor in the body politic, you know. And we come back in 100 years and find that faith-based initiatives absorbs like 38% of the gross national product, you know. <laughs> you're going to come back, you're going to find the school voucher program, which still uh, uh, will only allow charter schools and won't actually allow for school choice. We'll, we'll be, you know, we'll be spending, uh, 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 you know, 500 billion a year on this. You know, uh, 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 it's, it's. I, I, I I'm worried. <laughs> Sir, you're also a foreign correspondent. Where are you going next? Israel. I'm going to Israel for Easter. You know, I think it's going to be. I, I think it's going to be great. I'm, I'm just. Uh, uh, well, I mean, you know, great. You know, I just kind of got a little problems over here. But I do think that it's about time that we realize that. I mean, we we get away from the the, the nitty gritty of this negotiation stuff and realize that Israel is part of our culture, our society. It's the only free place on in in the Middle East at all. It's the only free. I mean, it's it, it is it is part of. Us, you know, and we have to like stand by that, you know. I mean, it's this whole there. There is this this um, repellent tendency that's been going on at least since the beginning of the Cold War. I think the American left has a lot to answer for this, as they do for so many things. Moral equivalency, you know, Americans don't seem to be able to look at situations and say, "Wait a minute, these people are right and these people are wrong." That's it, and we side with the people that are right. No, nobody was doing that when the Nazis were around. I say, oh come on, Hitler, Churchill, settle down. You know, we can do some land for peace. You know, land for peace. You know, Sudetenland, just for instance. You know, I mean, you take Sudetenland. You know, I mean, uh, nobody was saying land for peace. So I was talking to 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 a friend of mine. He's, he's a very very pro-Zionist friend of mine. He said, he said, look, peace peace would be good. He said, but you know, victory would be okay too. <laughs> Sir. Touching on the uh, last point you made about the Tenth Commandment, thou shalt not covet. Mm -hmm. Why do we seem to find, at least in certain quarters, some of the greatest fomenters of covetousness are theologians and various churchmen? And this is really interesting. Uh, I don't know if uh, you people over here in this, this arm of the room could, could hear that. But the question was, why do we find so many promoters of covetousness, so many promoters of class warfare and, 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 and entitlement? among prominent churchmen. And it's really interesting. I mean, that's probably the commandment that, that they violate most, you know. I don't think that people really, uh, uh, I think that's a commandment that doesn't get thought about much, is what, what, it, com what it comes down to. And the, uh, you know, the, 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 the Christian, particularly in the Christian context of justice, often gets wildly out of hand. You know, justice is not perfect equality. Justice is not sameness. You know, uh, justice is living within the law and making sure that other people live within the law. Uh, we have, um, uh, 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 my wife and I uh, uh, ascribe to basically free range uh, 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 child rearing techniques, you know, just let them do whatever they want. You know. we, we, we tried all the, the discipline and, you know, and structure and all that stuff, and that obviously wasn't working, so you just, just give in. That's what we do. But we have one rule uh, uh, that, we, that we stick to quite strictly, which is never ever uh, 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 is our, our little daughter allowed to use the word unfair. That's the one thing we don't want to hear, unfair. And when she says that's not fair, we say to her, look, it's not fair that you're cute, it's not fair that your parents are well off, it's not fair that you were born an American, it's not fair that you're going, going to, to uh, an unbelievably expensive play school <laughs> and, and, and you know, doubtless going to get decent schooling your whole life. It's unfair the kind of economic, and forget it with unfair, you know? The, that the other kid took the toy is, believe me, it's, you know, we can balance that out, you know? I, you know so she can't use the word unfair and in fact that is it would be a good word fair and unfair would be good words to banish from our whole political discussion there is no fair I think we probably yes <coughs> we, uh, we, we we all know that the fun you have with politicians but I wonder if there uh, is one politician or two politicians uh, in the 20th century that that you really admired and why well, there are a number of politicians that, that, that I admire. Unfortunately, the time to admire politicians are times that you never, ever want to be in. 
you know. I mean, of course, I admire Churchill, even in certain ways, admire uh, uh, Roosevelt, uh, you know, in the, in the World War II, not the Depression stuff, but in the World War II. Uh, uh, but, you know, you don't want to get yourself into that kind of situation where you have to admire politicians, you know. Yes, I mean, it's, it's these people, but I mean, you know, Churchill did a fabulous job during World War II, but then afterwards he was incapable of dealing with the social pressures and the, and the political turmoil. Uh, that, that Britain was thrust into essentially by the political process. Uh, not only do I have politicians that I like and admire and respect, that there aren't really that many of them that I don't. Uh, uh, it's, uh, politicians are, of course, professionally likable people, and most of them are quite respectable as far as they're... Uh, it's, it's the process that, that angers me, not the people. It's the process, not the people. Ma'am. Could you just share, please, what um, interesting rhetoric you might have about the Public as a traitor versus being private as a spy. Public as a traitor versus versus private as a spy. You, you're referring to the Hanson. Versus Clinton. Hanson versus Clinton. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah, it's. Uh, I, I, I suppose that in the end, one 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 has to vote for Clinton. Uh, I mean, it's much more. Uh, I think it's really much better to be a public traitor than a private spy because. Uh, even though we didn't stop him, we could see him. We were capable of stopping him. America could have put an end to Bill Clinton, uh, but, but of course they couldn't put an end to the, to the Hanson fellow because they didn't know what was going on. Sir? What do you think of Ronald Reagan? What do I think of Ronald Reagan? I think Ronald Reagan is a good example of a really admirable politician. However, it's also uh, important to remember the failures of, uh, of his eight years. He was unable to roll back that spending despite his enormous popular support. Uh, and that was because, not that wasn't just because the Democrats had a, had a majority uh, uh, in Congress. That was because of the nature of the political system. Money is power to politicians. Politicians will not let go of spending because it's what gives them their power. It isn't. It, it isn't so much. You'll find this on the right and on the left. You know, it, it, it's you know, right wing politicians are almost as bad about pork barrel stuff and actually rather worse about defense spending uh, uh, than the left wing. They may want they won't want to allocate it to different places, but it's the it's the net total of, of government spending. That the political system, because you're, you know, you cannot go to people and ask them to cut off their own hand. You can't go to businessmen. The left should should realize this years ago. You can't go to businessmen and say, you know, you guys are doing a great job with those AIDS drugs. Now, what we'd like we'd like you to do is to turn out those AIDS drugs without making a profit. Okay? Could you do that? Because I mean, you're doing really great about everything except the profit. Okay? So just could you just cut off the profit? You know? You know, you can't go to teenagers and say, teenagers, you can do anything you want, you know, and you can do anything you want. You can be whatever you want to be. You can do anything you want to do. Uh, and we trust you not to get pregnant or drug addicted or anything. And, you know, here's the whiskey and the car keys. You know, I mean, you can't, you just can't ask people to go against the nature of their situation. You can't ask politicians to relinquish their own power. You have to take it from them, you know. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Very much.